Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this event. Uh, it's great to see so many of these little tiles coming up on the screen as we start. Uh, my name is Ben Price. I'm the current social officer of the NDSA. For anyone who's not familiar with us, the NDSA is a local branch of the RBA. Uh, we run on a voluntary basis for architects, students, and, and really anyone interested in the profession and architectural design in general. Uh, if you'd like to know more about us, then by all means, please do check out our website at ndsa.org.uk. And we've also got social media presence on pretty much every platform. So please do follow us on there as well to hear more about our events coming up. This evening's event will be slightly different to some of the previous evenings that we've held. As I'm sure you may have already noticed, we're not in the conventional webinar format. So if you do have any questions, uh, we will still be having a Q&A discussion at the end, which will be held by our current president, Josh. If you do have any questions along the way, please just put them in the chat and we'll bring them up at the end. We'd also invite you to join in the discussion. Uh, if you want to turn on your microphone and camera during the Q&A as well, uh, we'll be having sort of a more all-rounded discussion as well. So this evening, we're joined by Tom Bennett, who's from Studio Park, and he's going to be talking about quite a few topics, I think, with us. So Tom, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. And yeah, real pleasure to be here um, back in the Midlands, at least virtually. Um, so I, I originally, just to give a bit of background about myself, I originally studied at the University of Nottingham. So I did all three of my parts of architecture there and also tutored there for a while. Um, and after graduating from part two, I worked for the artist Wolfgang Buttress, uh, also based in Nottingham for three or four years uh, before moving to Studio Bark. So yeah, that's, that's just a very brief um, summary of, of my kind of background and connection, I suppose. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for the invitation. I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, so I've got a, a kind of talk that I've prepared. So I, th I think I'm gonna talk for about half an hour, maybe to 45 minutes. And then if you do have any kind of questions or comments or things you'd you'd like to discuss, that'd be great to, to kind of go into a discussion at the end. So yeah, some of what I'm going to talk about is definitely architectural and some of it strays beyond, you know, what what we might conventionally think of as architecture. But um, really, the talk is focused around this, this issue of the, the climate crisis and and what we can do about it. So I've called it inside outside, um, the byline being or two fronts of action for architects in a moment of climate emergency, um, which is a bit more of a mouthful, let's say. So yeah, I suppose to, to begin, um, just a bit of background about Studio Bark. So the, the practice that I work for, we're a, a small practice based in East London. So a team of seven currently and yeah we do a lot of kind of bespoke residential stuff so we do quite a lot of work that's um you know under paragraph 79 or pre now known as paragraph 80 so a lot of kind of low energy um kind of low carbon architecture that's trying to sort of push the boundaries in in some way and also very kind of contextually based so often um, looking, looking at a sort of process of research into the vernacular and contextual drivers for these different projects. Another aspect of what we do is, um, is education and we're trying to kind of bridge the divide between design and construction through, through the way that we engage in education. So approximately once a year we'll run a, a live build project and we'll convene a group of students and uh, yeah sort of engage in a live build as a, a process of an educational process for, for them and also for us in terms of understanding how, how things actually go together on site. The kind of third string 
in the bow, I'd say, is, is U-Build. So U-Build is a modular off-site kind of construction system. So it's uh, kind of somewhere between Lego and Ikea, let's say, for the housing, for the, specifically for self-builders. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that later. But yeah, this kind of summarizes our, the way our business is structured, I suppose. So we have a, a holding company and then we have, you know, three companies that sit under that. So the architectural practice, we have a contractor, Studio of Art Projects, which we use primarily as the vehicle for these kind of uh, educational live builds. And then we also have U-Build, which is a kind of separate um, supplier, let's say. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to kind of dwell on the climate crisis for a long period of time, but um, I did think it'd be useful just to kind of contextualize the rest of this this evening, just to kind of recap a few a few key points. So, I mean, it, it's really fascinating actually when you when you dig into the history of climate science and you kind of you start to reckon with how long we've actually been speculating and then eventually knowing and forming a consensus around the problem of the greenhouse effect and its its impact on destabilizing our climatic system so yeah we've known about it for a really long time and the science actually goes right back to the victorian era so the first kind of scientists were already at that time speculating that large-scale coal burning could could alter the composition of the atmosphere and it was also known you know i think 165 years ago people had already established that carbon dioxide is a gas that traps heat um very effectively uh so yeah i mean this is the timeline it shows sort of a number of key milestones on this journey of knowing let's say and really by the 1980s there's there's quite a clear scientific consensus about about the problem and the sort of planetary implications of it so it's very interesting to kind of bear this in mind um, if you'd like to know more about that i recently listened to an episode of sustainable which is is quite an amusing kind of podcast uh, w worth checking out if, if anyone's into their podcasts and um, a recent guest, Alice Bell, who I think is involved in Possible, the NGO. So she's written a book that kind of documents this this history. Um, so yeah, it's quite it's quite fascinating. In in terms of um, getting to grips with this, then I mean, we had the the Rio summit was back in the early '90s, and this was you know when the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was was convened and world governments began this sort of process of deliberating and ostensibly trying to come to some sort of proposal for, for what to do about this massive issue. So COP or the Conference of Parties, that's where world governments get together and they try and figure out what, or agree rather what, what what's gonna be done. And so you see there've, there've been 25 of these actually already COP26 obviously will be in Glasgow in, later in the year and um, yeah they've been very ineffective in terms of actually sort of doing anything about curbing the emission of greenhouse gases on a global scale of course last month we had the latest IPCC report which um, you know casts a lot of doubt really on whether whether the kind of targets in the Paris Agreement are are even achievable. And so, you know, we've seen over the past two or three years, very, these very spectacular, um, you know, kind of catastrophic events that have been supercharged and made more likely by, by global warming and um, yeah, the breakdown of our climate system. So um, yeah, I don't know if people remember the eye of Sauron when the sea was actually on fire this year, like, you know, just these very surreal things. Um, and of course we're emerging from another type of crisis right now the global pandemic um but which was you know obviously difficult and tragic in in all sorts of ways but um yeah the climate and ecological crisis is 
although it's on a slower burn, let's say it's it's just of a completely different scale um, in terms of what the, the kind of impacts. So yeah, for, for roughly a similar period of time as the, the scientific consensus, we've, we've also had things that have been happening in the world of construction and architecture. So the Center for Alternative Technology kicked off in the 70s in response to the the oil crisis um, you know we had BRE beginning in the 80s uh, BRIAM sorry in the 80s kicking off and then Passive House Institute um, you know starting starting their work in the early 90s and consolidating in 1996 so yeah there, there has been there's been a like a green architecture movement environmental architecture has been a thing but it's it's been in the wilderness and it for whatever reason it hasn't um and possibly until quite recently really broken into sort of more mainstream discourse in the in the industry so yeah i get i suppose in terms of how studio bark fits into this we're we're seeing ourselves very much in that tradition of environmental architecture but also you know, trying to push it forward and do do new things and take it to new places. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for the next period about some of our work. Um, I think three projects. So the Cork Studio. Um, so people probably know CSK's very amazing Cork House. This is kind of like the budget Studio Bark version of that. Um, but we were we were doing this kind of research at a similar time as the cork house was also being sort of designed um so yeah this was for a garden building but the idea was can you do a building that is is more or less completely biodegradable in terms of its fabric so in this case the cork is is the cladding and it's also the insulation the structure and it's also the internal finish so you have one material and of course you have you know fixings and various various bits but you you do away with these kind of layers of membranes and things that that we kind of tend to have in our buildings so this was kind of an interesting experimental project for us um, at a small scale so another kind of quite recent project cliff house so this is one of our paragraph 80 projects has, has achieved approval of planning. And in this case, we were using some software called Ladybug and Honeybee and trying to kind of optimize the energy performance of the building. So looking at orientation, placement of windows and um, zoning and these kinds of things and seeing how we can drive down energy demand. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, increasingly talked about is the fact that operational energy is is one slice of the pie, right? So embodied carbon is is actually massive. It's potentially half in re, in typical residential projects. Um, so yeah, we need to be looking at that. And you know, if you think about the time scale impact of a project, let's say you know year zero is practical completion right so at that point a hundred percent of your carbon impact is embodied because there's no operational consumption that's happened yet uh, so over time operational kind of creeps up and embodied becomes less of a percentage of the total but really if you know if we're thinking about this window of opportunity that we have to do something about the climate crisis, um, which which is a, a small and closing window, really, in, in according to you know the the best science that we have. Um, so, when you apply that kind of lens to things, embody becomes becomes massively important. So, in terms of this project, there was you know it, it's a rural site, so you have the luxury of being able to to do things with the landscape so you know it's it's a conventional farmland site and there's an opportunity for tree planting some rewilding 
and for the landscape to become a carbon sequestering uh, you know, element within the scheme. So, yeah, I mean, trees trees absorb carbon at relatively sort of known rates, and so we did we did a bit of number crunching around you know what's the embodied projected embodied carbon, what's the projected operational carbon impact. Uh, so you can see those in terms of the yellow and red lines on these graphs, and then what is the carbon sequestering potential of of these 2000 trees that are going to occupy the site. Um, and so it's, it's quite kind of interesting just to, to look at that and the huge potential of, of landscape really um, to, to kind of have that, have that impact. So yeah, the next project I was going to talk about is one that is very much ongoing. So a bit of an experiment that we, we ran this summer and it very much builds on those live build projects that we've done over the previous years, um, which kind of originated out of the University of East London's construction weeks that they run. Um, so, yeah, no building as usual. We we built a house basically where it's, it's not quite finished. It's it's getting there um, with a, a team of twelve students. So the the kind of idea of this was really born out of a kind of frustration with the way that a lot of development happens and the motives that drive it and you know procurement as well and the way procurement happens and this this kind of division that we sometimes have um so yeah if you wanted to know a bit more about that wilf who's the kind of family director of studio bark has done Done a bit of a talk and uploaded it to youtube so if you check out our website that's the the link um you can you can hear some more specifically about some of the motivation for the project um but yeah as i was saying it's very it's very much kind of trying to posit an alternative that an alternative way of of doing things um, so the project uses the build system which is, yeah, as I mentioned, it's CNC cut, flat packed, um, kind of self build system. So, yeah, the idea is that it's kind of modular and you can do anything within the rules and constraints of, of the system. So it has some modular grids and there are certain rules that you need to obey. But within that, you know, as with Lego, you're kind of free to, to be a bit creative and um, make what you want. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all set out according to standard sheet sizes. So it's, it's reasonably efficient in terms of, you know, the, the percentage of the sheet that you're, you're using for parts when it, when it goes through the machine. Um, so another key thing about it is because it's mechanically fixed. So all of these boxes bolt together. Um, so it's, is designed in a way to, to kind of be dismantled. So it has an element of that circular thinking kind of embedded into the system. So yeah, that, that's the constructional approach for this project. These are a couple of photos in the model. So Nest House itself is a home for, for a couple who have mobility issues um, and uh, are getting on a bit in life. So it's, it's this kind of square donut with a, a small central courtyard and it's it's all on one level and it's planned around kind of mobility. Um, so another kind of interesting thing about the project is there's, there's no concrete in it. So the foundations are these kind of jack pads um, on compacted hardcore and all the retaining walls are, are reclaimed sleepers. Uh, and then, so yeah, here you can just see the, the kind of subframe going in. And then the, the U-build boxes for the floor kind of arriving. So yeah, the floor is built on top of the subframe and then the walls kind of start to go in and then installation of the roof boxes. Um, yeah, and once you've got the roof on, you, you can kind of be inside bolting it together, getting the internal walls in. Uh, yeah, so the student team also 
constructed this barn, which became like their mess hall, their kind of kitchen and social space. So we, um, they had use of an adjacent field to, for, to set up camp and to, to build various bits of infrastructure. So, you know, compost toilet, shower, that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, this, this barn was kind of constructed using, basically using waste material. Um, and yeah, another element of the program really was that, you know, students would have the opportunity to engage with specialists, so plumbers, electric, electricians, tradespeople. Uh, so each week had a kind of a different theme. And so there was, there was this kind of educational and themed knowledge delivery that that we tried to sort of bring into the program as well. And you can see here the clients. Um, so yeah, the client there on the left. And yeah, the, the house is kind of wrapped in membrane um, for breather membrane. So it's kind of an open panel system. So it remains vapor permeable. Uh, yeah, we had various guests come and deliver workshops. So the ROBA came and uh, we had a workshop on diversity in the profession and another workshop on ethics and various things. So yeah, this, this is kind of where the house is, um, where we've got to today. So the educational program has, has come to an end and it's, um, it's now on Studio Bark to, to kind of finish it. Um, but yeah, we were kind of getting there. It's, it's mostly cladding and some of, some of the interior stuff that it still needs to happen uh, but yeah I, th I think for us one of one of the sort of main you know positives really of this kind of thing was just bringing this this group quite a diverse bunch of you know students from different backgrounds also you know it's like they weren't all architecture students so there were some engineers and people coming from slightly different perspectives so yeah, and they've they've come together and done this quite significant thing, and um, yeah, hopefully had a memorable experience and, and made some good friends. So, yeah, that's that's just to cover some of Studio Bark's work. For the next section, I was going to talk a bit about activism and what we mean by that. So, yeah, just to begin with some definitions. So I think we probably all know, know what a protest is. So a protest can be static, it can be at a place, or it can be a march. It can be a mobile thing. Um, civil disobedience is a slightly different thing. So for example, the freedom ride riders in, um, yeah, in the civil rights movement in America in the 60s. So in the case of civil disobedience, people are deliberately breaking a rule, deliberately defying state power for some reason. So in this case, it was to kind of break Jim Crow era laws around segregation to highlight the injustice of those laws. Um, and another very iconic sort of famous example, obviously the suffragettes who, you know, um, at the time were, were seen as quite extreme, but obviously are, are venerated in retrospect and played an important part in um, achieving the vote for women. So they also engaged in a campaign that we would describe as civil disobedience. So deliberately doing stuff that's illegal. Um, yeah, the third kind of definition, direct action is a slightly different thing again. So a, a direct action is where you, you're not really trying to necessarily impact or, or lobby a political system. You're, you're directly intervening to, to prevent something usually. So this was a case recently in America where um, an activist found himself in, in an auction where federal land was being auctioned off to the highest bidder for extraction of oil and gas. And so he decided to prevent this by bidding on land that he obviously had no intention of, of buying. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a brave thing to do. Um, another example, yeah, pipe, oil pipelines have taps, um, believe it or not. So 
this was the case where some activists kind of broke into one of these compounds and basically switched the pipeline off. So again, it's a kind of example of direct action. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's some definitions. So I just wanted to cover that because I don't think the distinctions between these different uh, forms of activism are, are necessarily often really known or, or that well understood. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of climate, why, I suppose a personal question I sometimes would ask is like, why is, why is that even necessary or, or helpful? Um, and really this takes me back to, to kind of earlier in the talk when I was, you know, reflecting on how long we've known about this. Uh, so we've known about it for a really long time. So we've had, had a pretty good understanding of the problem for quite a long time. And we've also had people doing things, um, proposing and in fact, implementing solutions. So, you know, one that I'm particularly taken with is Heat, is a book written by George Monbiot in 2006. And it's, it's a very well kind of evidenced and researched proposal for how the UK could more or less keep its standard of living, but fully decarbonize by 2030. So he, he wrote this in the 2000s, um, you know, sadly not very much of it was implemented. So, you know, we've got an understanding of the problem, we've got solutions and we've got little or no action. Um, and really, I think this is because there's a missing third ingredient and that thing is is mandate. So we need the we need an understanding of the problem. That's obviously the starting point. But then we need the mandate. We need like impetus at a societal level, some kind of commitment or you know resolve that things actually need to change. We need to find not only find solutions but but implement them as well. So yeah, I think we need all three of these things. And I think that that one in the middle has been has been missing for a bit. So we've tried to kind of leapfrog straight from problem into proposing solutions. And like, uh, you know, a lot of solutions have been proposed that just no one's done anything with them. It's deeply frustrating. But anyway, so I think I've only kind of recently come to that way of like understanding understanding it or structuring um, how I talk about it. But I think intuitively, you know, I've, I think I've always had some intuitive sense that that's what's going on. And the role of activism is to therefore, you know, elevate this, the, the issue in order to build a mandate. And of course, um, there, there's kind of a scales, right? So big oil have pumped a lot of money into think tanks who've cast a lot of doubt, unreasonable doubts about whether climate change is or isn't happening, whether humans are or are not responsible. Um, and it's been very successful, unfortunately. So kind of activism is, is as I see it, like a, a counterbalance to that, those unaccountable forces that are trying to prevent uh, change and to guard their own sort of narrow short term interests. So my own kind of brush with activism, I suppose, my first encounter with it was while I was at university in Nottingham. So I was involved in various student groups and with some of those people attended the Camp for Climate Action in 2008. So the government at the time were proposing a new coal power, fired power station at Kings North in Kent, which which sounds quite mad now, um, but it somehow they thought it that was a reasonable thing to do ten years ago. Um, ultimately, they they didn't do it. There was a big protest camp, which may or may not have had something to do with that, um, but the project got canned. So, yeah. I, when I think back to that period, I think quite a lot was, there was quite a lot of stuff, quite a lot of good things were happening then. We had the Climate Change Act came in in 2009, 
uh, which was quite a groundbreaking kind of step in a way for a government to take. And it felt like things were kind of moving in the right direction. And then we had the financial crisis and I think I think everyone took their eye off the ball and you know various things that had been coming you know like the 2016 target for zero carbon homes for example that was that was scrapped there were various positive things that were then uh burned at the at the altar of austerity and yeah i think that's deeply unfortunate but um can't change the past um I, I think i think that idea of a lost decade though is really is really well captured by this photo so this was february 2019 so well after the ipcc special report on 1.5 degrees um and yeah not very it's the first time mps have have debated climate change for for a very long time and not very many of them showed up um which which i, th I think is a litmus test for how seriously the the political system is is treating the issue at that point in time um so yeah i, th I think these places kind of well summarize my my own kind of feelings at that time and, and still in some senses that there's a powerful you know negligence happening um, on the part of of the political system around this issue so yeah I, I suppose my my next kind of you know big involvement with activism I suppose was was um, when XR Extinction Rebellion came along in 2019 so they have three kind of aims which is around you know acknowledging the problem so having having governments declare that it's an emergency situation and and work to educate the public about that um the, the second aim is is around setting an ambitious kind of target so you know being really really ambitious about about the targets that we're setting and i think you know whether you think that's possible or, or achievable, it's what it starts to do is um, get us to think about decarbonisation as as something that we we need to start thinking about and start doing rather than kind of constantly kicking into the long grass and saying, oh, well, yes, 2050, 2100, we'll, we'll think about it then. Um, and then the third, the third aim, which I think is really important, is calling for a citizens assembly on this so a citizens assembly is is a deliberative expansive democratic process where you you select a representative sample of the population by sortition and they go through this this kind of process where they they get input from experts and advisors and they deliberate and they come up with solutions and and vote on those solutions and ratify a program at the end of the process so you know this is dealing with this is going to be an upending of the entire way that our society works so you know personally i think there's a real need for democratic buy-in into that process and this could be a good way of doing it um yeah so xr 20 april 2019 um i expect people that was on people's radars at the time um, but it, it was a massive thing and I think it surprised a lot of people at just how much uptake it had had and you know going back to this idea of a lost decade I think a lot of people were wallowing in private despair and this was um, you know finally an outlet where people could express their frustration really that um, the government was not taking this seriously so yeah one of the things to say about XR is um, they were obviously occupying public spaces including bridges and one of the things that enabled that to happen was the fact that a certain number of people were willing to to stay there and until the police carried them away so you know i think if if no one had been willing to do that the, the police could have shut the protest down much sooner and they wouldn't have had the impact that they did so you know i, I saw people making taking that step and decided that 
um, I was willing to to be in that situation as well. Um, yeah, so ultimately I got I got prosecuted for that, um, and unfortunately my defence didn't go so well. Uh, but I am appealing, and the the reason I'm appealing actually this is a bit of a digression now. Um, so the Crown Prosecution Service have various guidance that they look at when they decide whether or not to pursue particular kind of cases and this sort of thing. And there are a lot of people that get arrested and things like that, and they never um, they never go to court. The the CPS decide not to pursue it. So part of that is a public interest test. And actually, the CPS guidance around this says, I mean, this is a direct quote from the guidance. Um, and it says the criminal prosecutions are really about dealing with violence and intimidation. Um, now, Exile, is, as some people may know, is a very explicitly nonviolent group. Um, they have a very strict code around nonviolence. So, yeah. Um, but I mean, if we if we think about the the impacts, or you know, what what was the impact of that? Um, you know, that there was a lot of media coverage, and I think that's partly because the media was kind of fed up of Brexit by that point and ready to talk about something else. Um, but it you know it did get the the issue on the agenda, on the media agenda, political agenda, um, and of course you know hot on the heels of that two week period in April, we had the UK Parliament declare a climate emergency. Um, and I was, I was talking about the Citizens Assembly, but a number of select committees did actually, uh, last year, I think, convene a, a, a Citizens Assembly. It was called Climate Assembly UK. Uh, look it up. It's very, it's fascinating what the, the conclusions it came to. So, you know, I, I think it did. It did have a certain amount of success in, you know, unlocking some change. Um, you know, qualified success didn't achieve all of its aims, but um, yeah, it's interesting when we look at the the polling and the data as well. That yeah, around that period, there was a definite uptick in public concern. And I think this was this was a pivotal moment. Um, the yeah, declaring is one thing, action is another thing, of course, but um, to, to have a sort of public acknowledgement of the seriousness of the situation from Parliament, I think, was was an important step as compared to where we were, um, you know, previously. So, I mean, yeah, I've talked a bit about practice, I've talked a bit about activism, and I suppose I wanted to move on to talk about how those things might interact or you know if you've got the venn diagrams where where might the overlap be between those sorts of things so this is what i've i'm referring to as the kind of inward transformation or the work of kind of looking in and and transforming transforming the way the way we work and the way we do things so you know i, th I think part of this is around advocacy and um you know speaking publicly on on the issue which is is something we try to do as a practice. Uh, we've we've recently, our director Nick, along with Sophie Pelsmakers, um, has has kind of recently come out with this book, part of a new RIBA um, series called Design Studio. So this is specifically looking at at the climate crisis. Um, so yeah, if you if you haven't haven't heard of that, I'd I'd commend you to to kind of look it up. Um, Architects declare, of course, I think has been a really important, um, you know, movement or or kind of thing to emerge within the profession recently. Uh, for my own part, I've been in, quite involved in helping to launch ACAN, the Architects Climate Action Network. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ACAN because I think it it quite well summarises the, the possibilities of um, combining. A kind of activist approach with, you know, doing things in in your sort of professional sphere of influence. Uh, so yeah, ACAN works draws very heavily from the activist world. It works in, with these very deliberative processes, such as consensus decision making and um, 
that's that's I think been quite important to the way that the the grief has kind of grown and the success that it's had. It's um it's differentiated into now kind of nine thematic groups looking at different areas. So you know everything from existing buildings, embodied carbon to to natural materials. So yeah, I would say if you, if you have a particular interest in any of these. Um, you might find that thematic group is, is quite a good place to hang out and um, some interesting things, initiatives and projects kind of happening there. Or, you know, even if you don't have an interest, but maybe, you know, you've, you've always wanted to know more about something. Um, yeah, you don't have to be an expert to get involved. It's, it's a completely grassroots thing. One of the big things we're pushing for is regulation of embodied carbon. So if it's half of impact, then why is it completely unregulated when obviously we do have a certain amount of regulation of operational operational carbon? So yeah, we're pushing for that and proposing a new part Z, which interestingly, this was recently picked up by the Embodied Carbon Working Group headed by Simon Sturgis. So they've gone ahead and drafted this to, you know, to show legislators what what it would actually look like in practice and um, I think make it make it appear more achievable uh, through that through that effort uh, which it is very achievable it, it could be done uh, we, we're also looking the education group is is very active so there are ACAN groups in in various schools of architecture around the country and so we've had some really good um, workshops that the education group have run with um, heads of school and tutors and and so on so I think that's that's been quite positive and yeah we're slowly accumulating a kind of resource on on our YouTube channel um, so the kind of circular economy series was very popular um, yeah so if you're interested in that do do take a look and yeah, but like all sorts of random things have come out of ACAM. Like we did, we did this thing called Architects Admit at Future Build. So we had a confession booth, and we encouraged architects to uh, confess their work-related environmental sins. So it, it was kind of you know fun on one level, but also serious in terms of di trying to diagnose you know what are, what are the, some of some of the things we're dealing with as individuals and collectively as a profession uh, so we're also kind of backing um, other initiatives that are kind of happening so the climate and ecological emergency bill which is another thing that's come out of xr and is is being proposed in parliament we're kind of backing that um, so yeah that that's kind of a bit about about acan so i think in in parallel with thinking about what we do, you know, what we do as professionals and how, how we transform our practice in light of, you know, in light of the science and, and everything we know about that. There's also, you know, an, another way to engage with this problem. And I think this is less talked about and I think it feels less natural for architects somehow. Um, Maybe it goes against the grain a bit, but I think it's it's another kind of powerful way that we can use our agency and engage with this situation. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's read this book, but it's it's a really good it's a really good reference for understanding kind of the root causes of of the situation we're in. And um, yeah, in the book, Naomi Klein spoiler alert um has has two sources of hope so one is the transformation in in renewable energy and particularly solar so the crashing price increasing efficiency of solar energy and the second is is what she calls blockadia um so yeah i'm gonna talk a bit more about blockadia um yeah so this was again a project a studio about project we ran as part of a construction week and the idea was that um, you could get a load of u-build boxes and modify them slightly and use them to build installations in public space 
and the purpose really of that is to to try and hold that public space and to you know to um to have some infrastructure at a protest site so in particular if you if you have a platform and it's above head height if it's above say two meters then it, it becomes more tricky for for the police to take it down they have to they have to be careful about how they do that they probably have to get a risk assessment it takes a bit of time um, so yeah we, we set the challenge to some students of you know using these modules to construct various different towers and installations that would um that would kind of meet that requirement of allowing a person to be at a certain height um, and so yeah this this kind of idea was was taken up by xr in in october 2019 and it was crowdfunded crowdsourced um some boxes were cut and delivered to trafalgar square and um yeah it was it was quite amazing to see complete strangers coming together and engaging with with this idea in quite an intuitive way uh, this was actually a video. I, I tried to find the video, unfortunately couldn't. But um, yeah, it, it's quite fascinating to see as a, as a kind of you know experiment with public space of of um, you know dumping these boxes there and seeing what people would do with them. Um, so they were used to create various structures, and uh, yeah, it was fascinating to look at the different ways that people interacted with those. Uh, it, there was a stage, so George Monbiot on the left and Orbital doing a gig on the right uh, in Trafalgar Square. And um, yeah, they were kind of modified to have have the ability for protesters to kind of lock to them. So again, it, it just makes it slightly more time consuming to, to extract people from that situation and allows that public space to be to be held by the group for a kind of a longer period of time. Um, yeah, and protest ar architecture, I suppose, can can also be iconic in a way. Uh, I think it's quite something quite iconic about this photograph. So that's um, Nick, who's obviously um, one of our directors, kind of stood on this on this tower in Trafalgar Square um, before before being removed. So yeah, I, I think there are kind of various examples of this this kind of tendency, you know, of using physical objects as kind of protest props um, that we've seen over the past kind of year or two outside the Tate. Of course, there was the, the kind of Tensegrity towers that XR have also developed. And Finn Harper wrote a, a very kind of erudite um, design piece about this and talking about the, the legacy of high tech and so on, which Again, it's, it's worth a read if, if you haven't seen that. Um, and then, yeah, further afield in, in Hong Kong, there have been also some interesting examples of, of you know, how people harvest materials from, from the site of a protest and use it to modify the, the urban realm to, to make it amenable to protesters and not very amenable to um, the militarized police there. So, yeah, so the, those are those are really some examples. Um, I'm I'm getting to the end now. Conscious that I've been talking for a while, so I suppose I'll I'll, I'll just try and draw this around to to some kind of point. Um, so I, I think we need to we need to understand architecture and what we're doing in in um, in a broader context that you know is part of a. A bigger thing called the construction industry and it sits within the economy and the political context and i think we need to be really aware of that i would add that this this diagram is not to scale um so yeah in terms of inward looking i think i think you know we need to we need to get our stuff together and think about how we how we transform what we're doing and how we transform the way we we practice and I think groups like Architects Declare and ACAN are, are, are doing a lot of that stuff. And of course, Letty as well, um, been really important in the space. Um, and, and the ROBA, of course, as well, with um, 
you know, the 2030 challenge and so on. So I think, I think that's one aspect of what has to happen. But um, yeah, and I would say, sorry, this is a very terrible sketch, but I hope it, hope it um, communicates the point. So I think the second front we need to be working on is, is looking outwards and thinking, you know, what, what is it that we offer as architects, um, you know, or, or as citizens to, to these wider movements that are pushing for, you know, transformative systemic change at a societal level, because I think that's, that's really what's needed. And, you know, it, we, we can't go for this kind of incremental approach where we're out of time for that. So, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's a hugely important part of what needs to be done or, or what we could be doing. Um, and again, we can think about this in terms of problem mandate solution. So an example of this from a, a problem perspective, uh, the Center for, T uh, for Contemporary Nature, which is part of forensic architecture, so they've done, you know, various studies where they're using mapping and they're using skills that are very much architectural in character to expose and analyze and understand aspects of, um, of the problem. In, in this case, kind of wildfires and um, they've also looked at fracking and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, mandate building. So I think you know, movements like XR are, are building that mandate. They're, they're getting the word out to the public. They're sounding the alarm. They're putting pressure on, on the political system to, to actually implement, to, to commit to some sort of program of implementation uh, on, on this issue. So, yeah. And then this, I think, is a really interesting example from the AA. So Ground Lab have been doing some work looking at how they illustrate um, the Green New Deal. So the Green New Deal is a transformative program. It's probably the kind of thing we need, something along those lines. So this is, you know, very much solutions focused work. And again, very architectural in character. Uh, yeah, so I suppose just to wrap up, I mean, this is a quote from the former chief scientific advisor to the UK government, David King. And he said, what we do over the next three to four years, I believe, is going to determine the future of humanity. We are in a very desperate situation. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's quite, you know, sobering to reflect on where we are and reflect on the, the kind of people that are, are making these statements as well. Um, so to, yeah, I suppose to use another architectural metaphor before I end, I sometimes think about, you know, when you're at university and you've got your final crit coming up, you think, well, yeah, it's really time to kind of pull my finger up because I don't want to go to my final crit with, with no work. So, um, yeah, that's, I suppose, one way to think about um, where we're at in, in a sense. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me here tonight. I, I hope some of that was kind of, uh, interesting or resonated on some level and yeah very happy to take any questions or have a bit of a discussion thank you tom that was um yeah really insightful i think um and and raised a lot of questions that uh have made a few of us uh, perhaps uh, a little uncomfortable to uh, admit to um i think yeah i think in terms of kind of um an initial comment from myself. Uh, how do you see, or how are you within Studio Bark? Have you kind of implemented something within um, uh, the the office culture or the office kind of um, manual or philosophy that that kind of pushes it in this direction, or has kind of a, a kind of a, a business um, kind of element to it, uh, practically speaking, in order to be able to to stick around to be able to support and deliver projects that that kind of push this um uh, philosophy is, is there is there something within the office that that kind of covers that or yeah it's a really good question um we have so over the past couple of years we've been through quite a collaborative process in the office of 
revisiting and rewriting our business plan. So thinking, you yeah. know, thinking from first principles about what's the kind of vision and mission and what are we really trying to do here? Um, and then kind of breaking that down into, yeah, operationally, what does that mean in terms of the kind of projects we want to do and the targets we want to set? So, yeah, I think, I think that's been a very, a very helpful process and, you know, it's, it, it kind of, um, forces you to reckon with some of the hard questions about mm -hmm. you know, how, how much, um, how much time do you have to uh, spend sort of getting fees in and surviving and how much capacity have you got for doing things that are a bit more risky and pushing the envelope and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I would say that process was was really useful and actually doing it as as a whole team. So rather than just at director level, it was, um, yeah, I, I think it made us feel quite bought into the sort of approach. Um, okay, um, so I, I'm going to uh, allow you, I think it would come up with a, a statement saying um, I'm requesting you to uh, unmute, but it, it's entirely up to you. If you if you would like to join in and have, if you've got questions, then um, uh, by all means jump in. And I've, uh, I've, I've got one, Josh. Yeah, go ahead, Mick. Great talk, um, Tom. But there was a bit of a chat in the background um, within the NDSA channel, and we're all kind of reevaluating our lives <laughs> and our education based on this talk. So obviously, it's hit home, which is good. Um, I kind of suppose further on from what Josh was saying, how do you implement some of these, I suppose, how do you make them policies within a practice when you've got this kind of mentality of that's how we've always done it, you know, and that's kind of the same thing you get with a lot of commercial developers. When I posted um, one of this event kind of to reshare it with colleagues on LinkedIn, um, I actually talked about an experience I had the other week where a quantity surveyor said, um, you know, uh, I don't really care about the environmental cost that doesn't build buildings, you know, it's all about the money. And, you know, I was looking at one of your graphs and I was thinking, actually, the environmental cost will overtake the financial cost at some point. Mm. And it's, it's, we need to act now to kind of get ahead of that curve. Um, what kind of advice would you have for a practice that's kind of stuck in their ways, I suppose? You're muted, Tom. Sorry, yeah, I, I couldn't unmute myself there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think I think you've raised a few really good points there, and um, I suppose in terms of in terms of the practice, like the practice itself, I'm quite. I suppose I'm quite privileged to be with a relatively small group of people that are all reasonably on the same page about things. Yeah. Um, so it hasn't been a big fight. Whereas, you know, and I've I've got colleagues in ACAN who are at practices that are a bit more, you know, a bit more business as usual, and you know, struggling to to kind of make their voices heard and like agitate for change. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think employers will be increasingly sort of sensitive to this and will want to be seen to be kind of doing the right thing in order to to attract good employees and to sort of maintain their reputation. Mm. So it's it's very reputation based kind of profession we're in, I suppose. Um, I suppose it's a generational thing as well as as the grey haired blokes kind of retire. You're going to get the new young blood in who are going to have I've had this exposure to this, I suppose, this current uh, political climate, you know, and maybe there's some change with there, but that that's perhaps too slow. Yeah, I think I think that probably is is a thing that's happening and will continue to happen. And um, yeah, I suppose we just we just have to try and accelerate that. Um, I don't I don't really have a good answer to be honest, but. Um, I, I would say, I mean, the second point you made was around like engaging with other consultants and yeah. contractors, particularly, which, which again, I think is is a tricky is a tricky thing. But um, 
I think what's what's quite interesting about the declare movement particularly is is there's also kind of engineers declare and contractors declare mm. and a, a lot of re, a lot of like really big players have signed up to that um, so you know if you're in a room where all of the consultants and the contractor more or less have have signed up to this same set of principles I think you know that that does give you some sort of basis to to argue for you know consideration of the climate on its own terms aside from you know financial considerations um, but I, yeah i don't have any direct experience of that so yeah i mean I, I suppose with contractors if you make a, a a regulation they will have to follow it which will probably probably come from a government you know kind of implementation plan but I suppose I was just thinking of an example I dealt with the other week. We had to do a BRIAM report for a building that we were converting. So it was great that we were converting an existing building for reuse. That's a good tick in the box. Um, and we were demolishing some of the facades. We could have retained the brickwork and reused it. But the contract said, you know, it's going to cost too much to actually do that. So that, that's what I mean when I talk about the financial environmental costs. There's all that embodied energy that's gone into that brick that's been there for 30 years. But it's just going to go into hardcore, which I suppose is is being recycled but it could be this kind of circular uh, economy as you were talking about mm. yeah yeah it's a really good point i mean it's it's kind of a lot of stuff is down cycled isn't it so it's yeah. technically reused but for a lower grade kind of use i suppose mm. but yeah i think i think you're right i mean a lot of this stuff does just need it needs kind of the systems to be in place and it needs a sort of regulatory framework to catch up a bit so you know certainly a lot of the focus of ACAN is is motivated by these kinds of things so yeah. recognizing you know that we do have some agency but we're not all powerful um the architect might not be the most powerful person in a project team um, no. No. and and so yeah certain there's a certain amount of carrot and stick needed um to kind of move things in a good direction i suppose so, thinking positively moving forward it's probably the employers of the practice as a job to try and educate their peers into you know some of these kind of topics you know because it might just be that they don't they don't know and I made a comment talking through when you were talking through this that you said that the uh, extinction rebellion are asking the government to educate the public but in fact really it should be us educating ourselves and you know it shouldn't be through mass media information it should be through scientific fact you know what i mean so we can formulate opinions based on fact as opposed to third-hand information uh, but no great talk thank you very much i'll let somebody else get a, a word in now <laughs> thank you yeah thank you for that uh Mick. um yeah so you should all be i've just put a message in the in the chat but you should all be able to unmute yourselves should you wish to uh put forward a question um if you're you're unable to do that for whatever reason, you're welcome to put it in the the chat on the the side as well. Um, do we have any other more comments from the group? I, I'd like to ask one actually, if that's yeah. all right. Um, I was just quite interested actually, um, just about I suppose it's, it's the inevitable topic of the pandemic that's come up in pretty much every conversation for the last couple of years now. That I suppose with us all sort of retreating almost to very residential settings, obviously we're not all equipped with, I, I suppose maybe a good analogy to start with is almost, if you consider offices as public transport and homes as cars, we've kind of retreated from this shared sort of space of, of shared energy to individually sort of working in, in this kind of, I suppose, smaller scale, but I suppose less efficient environment. I wondered if that kind of, transition has had any sort of bearing or impact on how from an architectural perspective we're sort of considering these climate emergency yeah really good question um i mean i, I suppose one one way to to respond to that i mean i think that increasingly there's there's recognition about the importance of retrofits and the fact that you know, we've, we've had a few programs from the government on this. So we had the, the Green Deal, we had the, more recently the Green Homes Grant, um, which was recently given a very bad review by the National Audit Office in terms of being like a very poorly 
lifetime program. Um, so yeah, I, I think the pandemic has highlighted the importance of that. It's it's something like between fifteen and twenty percent of of our global emissions is sorry of our national uh, carbon impact is is on heating homes and um, yeah, obviously uh, something like eighty percent of the buildings we'll have in twenty fifty are, are the ones we've got now. So mm. it, that to me that feels like it needs some sort of um, large scale infrastructure in, intervention by the state to kind of make that happen. And very interestingly, there was a campaign launched yesterday uh, called Insulate Britain. I don't know if people have heard about it. I it's saw a headline like, for it. Um, so again, they're, they're kind of pushing for that. I mean, ACAN are pushing for that. We've launched something called Household Householders Declare, um, encouraging every household to, to sort of sign up and put pressure on Alok Sharma, head of COP. So yeah, I suppose, I suppose that's only one aspect to your question maybe, but I think um, I think it's the, the pandemic's really highlighted how key that is as an issue for us to, to kind of reckon with. Um, I don't know yeah. that kind of speak to what you were getting at. Or... Yeah, no, I, I just find it, I think it's a really interesting topic in general and I find it even more sort of interesting. Obviously now we're quite well, now sort of transitioning out of this sort of siloed thinking but i suppose it, it was quite fascinating to see that there was a lack of say like cars on the road and we saw actually benefits coming through um but obviously there was i suppose a, a balance to be had with less travel but more inefficient working spaces so I, I i do find it quite quite interesting yeah so no thank you for your answer and thank you for your for your talk it was really interesting there is a there's a couple of uh, questions in the chat that I'll uh, I'll read out. Uh, one from uh, Adam Caffrey. Um, thank you for a really insightful talk. You mentioned the lost decade after the financial crisis. Do you fear a similar effect after the pandemic? Or I mean, there's a lot more accessibility via social media nowadays. Um, so maybe that would have a, a balancing effect. But what are your thoughts, Tom? Yeah. I think it's I think it's something we've got to watch. Um, it's, it's something I'm worried about definitely. I, I think it you know there've been these moments of of relative awakening. So I'd say the 1970s, the oil crisis. Uh, we had the early 90s. We had the Rio Earth Summit and all the stuff that happened around that. Um, yeah, 2008. Climate Change Act, and then now, sort of 2019, we've seen, you know, unprecedented sort of protests and media coverage, and government making the right noises. So, mm. yeah, I th I think it's a risk, um, but yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that that there's enough momentum that we're not going to kind of reach for the snooze button again. Uh, yeah, if we don't do that. Yeah, hopefully that will um, that will not be the case. Um, and as I say, I think with compared to two thousand and nine, there's a lot more uh, social communication available to share that information and put pressure on via not maybe not physical protests, but digital protests as well. Um, so hopefully, uh, I think you have to have you know some some level of hope in this rather than um, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think maybe this isn't a particularly hopeful point but I mean we are seeing kind of impacts in a way that we weren't before so it's just you know mm. on a physical level it's much harder for um you know to for, for people to get all um it's yeah it's a bit more present so yeah I'm also hopeful that we won't just um we won't take our eye off the ball in the same way that, that I, I fear did happen previously yeah um there's a there's a general comment from sue that apparently only a thousand people have signed the household declares so far um so i would yeah definitely push, urge people to go and have a look at the acan website um i've left a link a direct link via our website uh in the chat so people can follow that through um on our resources page and uh, 
I haven't seen it, but I assume there's a link to the households declare via the ACAN and the architects declare pages. Yeah. No. I've got another question for Tom, Josh. Go for it, Mick. Um, so I noticed as well in the, the attendees this evening, we've got a few academics from Nottingham Trent and uh, University of Nottingham, which is good. Um, I suppose you touched on education, but we, you didn't really kind of expand. Uh, obviously, you've done those projects with, uh, I can't remember which university you said in London, which are great. You know, how, how do you see this rolling out? What do you think the RIBA should do with regards to to that uh, we do as a, um, as a as the Nottingham and Derby Society of Architects also sit on the regional education board you know so you know we we have that chance to have conversations on this so it'd be interesting to hear some more about that yeah definitely um I, I think in terms of like specifically addressing the the kind of construction programs and that kind of thing I, I think this is something we are seeing more of so I think I think various schools are are doing kind of variations of this, um, but you know, I mean, in terms of the program we did this summer, we had we had twelve places and we had over a hundred applications. Right. So I think there's there's a huge demand for this kind of thing among students, and um, yeah, so it's it's something that could be expanded, and certainly the the kind of no building as usual program we're we're trying to move that into a place where it can be kind of like a franchise or, or something that like a template that people could pick up and yeah. buy elsewhere. And so, you know, we wouldn't need to be involved, but um, yeah, I, I think it would be a positive thing to, to see more of that happening. Um, so, yeah. Thank uh, you. Uh, any more questions from the, the group? I noticed when I mentioned academics, Aisha's actually put a question in the chat. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, thank you for that, Nick. Uh, so one question from Aisha. Um, how do you think the business as usual, as usual practices could do with could do to begin to transition to incorporate the ROBA Climate 2030 into their design ethos? Uh, for some, I would imagine it is a required a lot to require uh, to think about. Sorry, I've just completely garbled that. Aisha, uh, what do you think the first hurdle could be and where could they go to get support? Great question. Um, I, yeah, I think, I, I suppose the first thing is to, to make some space for that in practice. So to set aside some time and resource to, to look at the issue. And, you know, initially it might be getting someone in, um, talk about climate literacy and carbon literacy. That, that would probably be a, a good starting point. Um, I, I think practices could also engage through ACAN and Architects Declare. I think there's a lot of knowledge there. Um, and I know that Architects Declare are working on a, a practice guide. So, you know, maybe less specific to the RIBA 2030 challenge, which um, has, has specific targets that are slightly different to the Architects Declare sort of declaration points um but yeah i think i think there are a lot of resources out there so yeah. it's you know it's for practices need to decide whether they're whether they're in a position to sort of structure and digest those and begin to weave them into their processes or or whether they might need some help with that from consultants. i suppose on on one uh, level, it would it's certainly for kind of a, perhaps a medium practice where they they have uh, different, but they will focus on different sectors or have uh, work in different sectors. It would be a case of starting with the 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 uh, perhaps quote unquote easiest area and and honing that and and before moving on to to a more difficult um, typology of building perhaps or different. For you know, uh, uh, domestic housing compared to infrastructure, I think going in cold feet on infrastructure might be a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, although it's, it's not without its, um, uh, you know, it, it's one of those that could also be looked at and, and does need to be looked at. Um, so it, maybe it's how they how they approach it within the office uh, practice as well, and where they use it, choose their starting point. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I suppose just to add to that, there's, you know, there's quite specific training for the different kind of typologies or different types of work, I suppose. So, mm. you know, if, if a practice is doing a lot of retrofit, there's the kind of past 2035 and retrofit coordinator kind of trainings and, um, you know, if it's more residential or cultural buildings, then, um, yeah, maybe just sending someone on the past house course, that might be like a good start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just I think also the, the, along with the five uh, uh, mandatory competency that came in this year for chartered architects, the climate literacy one will be coming in next year. And I think that will then increase people's awareness generally and allow them to better understand the situation um, that they and yeah, getting more involved, hopefully. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, so the yeah, I suppose the way the profession is regulated is, is slowly shifting as well. Mm. Um, okay, it, there's a general comment from Paul. Um, are, are you are you aware of anyone within the RIBA who is is acting as a, a champion for this uh, in terms of changing the narrative? Um, or um, I mean, my my knowledge of the inner workings of the RIBA is is limited, but um, there are some really good people on council. There's obviously Maria Smith, who's you know a very well known and vocal person on this issue, and Duncan Baker Brown as well. Um, okay. Yeah, you have people like Nina Hassman, who is, um, I think, might maybe chair of the Sustainable Futures Group. So they're they're doing quite a lot of good work. So, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of people with some, you know, very sincere uh, intentions who are doing a lot of good work in the RBA at the moment. Um, Okay, great. Um, yeah. I've got uh, a final question, Josh. Okay, one final question for Mick, and, and I think we'll we'll let um we'll close this session. And I suppose this isn't just to Tom, this is I suppose to everybody that's um in attendance. Obviously, Nottingham um decided that they were gonna target 2028, two years earlier than everyone else. And there seems to have been something in the uh in the uh, in the press the other day saying we're on target, which I just I I don't really understand how we are because I've not really seen anything positive. So uh, Paul's mentioned greenwashing. I assume this is probably just greenwashing. But has anyone actually seen us, um, you know, getting towards that target with positives? Because obviously there's a lot of demolition happening. There's a lot of building happening. And I'm not necessarily seeing buildings made of cork. Mm. <laughs> yeah, somehow I don't think the, uh, the rebuilding the uh, Broadmarsh out of cork is, is, is quite there yet. I don't know. You, you've got to see some of the designs, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, are, are you aware of that, Tom? I suppose you know. Have you seen anything or come across anything being a former Nottingham citizen? Yeah, I suppose I'm less ear to the ground probably than some people on the call. But um, I did interestingly at Futureville just before the pandemic. Um, one of the panels was it had. Um, it had Etienne Scott, who's obviously quite involved in XR, and it had and is a Nottingham resident, and it had um, Alan Simpson, the former MP, who I think is is quite involved in green initiatives in the city. Um, so they definitely spoke about it. I, I can't quite remember the the ins and outs, um, but yeah, that that talk might still be available somewhere. Yeah, no, that's that's positive because I've heard of one of those names, but the other I hadn't. So perhaps there's a conversation to be had following this with them. See if we... And there's also, um, of course, like Blueprint and Igly headed yeah. up by Nick Ebbs. They're, they're doing some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, around this. And so, yeah. But um, that's as much as I know. I mean, well, the funny thing was the, the image on the front of this headline was a picture of three trams, you know, and whenever they talk about anything to do with the environment in Nottingham, there's always a bloody picture of the tram. <laughs> Which, you know, it's successful. It's better, but better than nothing, I suppose. There's a bit more to it than just the tram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, okay, uh, I think I will we'll, we'll close the, uh, the session there. Um, thank you very much, for Tom, for, for giving your time and joining us this evening for your presentation. It's very insightful and uh, plenty of food for thought. 
Um, and thank you to Ben, our social secretary, for uh, coordinating this the particular evening. Um, I think we've got a couple more events uh, next week, uh, one next week and one the week after. Next week is uh, with David Ames, who's going to be talking about um, uh, Letchworth Garden City and the the concepts that were were explored there and how they might um, assist in a kind of a post pandemic environment in built environment. Um, for two weeks from now, or two weeks in two weeks on the twenty eighth, uh, we'll also have a talk with from Planning Design in Derby, who are going to be uh, looking at the environmental. Uh, economic and social benefits of, of restoration and refurbishment of uh, key structures around the cities, our cities. Uh, so those are coming up for Nottingham uh, for this month, sorry. Um, so by all means register for those if you if they strike a chord. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. So once again, thank you, Tom, and I hope to see everyone uh, sh uh, in the near future. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks, Tom.